I'm sure if you have been a Christian for any length of time, that there have been times when you have picked up and read God's Word and you've read something which has taken you really by surprise, even though you may know the story extremely well. It happened to me a little while ago as I was reading through Two Kings and I came to the story of Naaman. And uh, I, the version that I use is the ESV. And I came uh, to verse 13, which is behind you in ESV, in the version of the ESV. And I thought, I've never seen that verse before, like that. And I went and I looked at all the other versions and the vast majority of the versions translate that verse in a similar way that Mike read to us. They translate it as the servants going to Naaman and saying, my father, if the prophet had bid you some great thing, would you not have done it? And I was quite taken by the translation in the ESV which reads, But his servants came near to him and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? And I look back and I looked at, obviously I looked at the uh, uh, King James and New King James Version. And you know, in, in, in those versions, when you read a verse and they have stuck in the words in italics which the translators have put in to try and um, to help us to understand it. If you take the italics out of that verse, you get very close to the reading like that. And I thought, most versions, the way that verse is translation, translated, it puts the emphasis on Naaman's response. It puts the emphasis on how is Naaman going to respond to God's word. But as it's translated in the ESV, the emphasis is on the greatness of the word itself that's been given to Naaman through Elisha. And as I thought about it, I thought, the greatness of the word does not depend on Naaman's response. If Naaman had turned around and carried on in his own foolish way, it wouldn't have altered in any sense the greatness of the word that he had received. All it would have shown would have been his foolishness and his pride. It does not matter how he responds to it. But the word is great because it is the word of God that has come through the prophet Elisha. And I began to think that through. What a lesson that is for us. That when you and I pick up the scriptures, that when you and I read the Bible, do we come to the Bible thinking we are going to receive the great word of God. When we come to church to listen to the preaching of God's word, and as we listen to it, do we realise we are receiving a great word? It doesn't matter how we respond to it. It doesn't matter whether we accept what God is saying to us or not. What has come to us is the great word of God. The fact that the gospel is preached and people reject it doesn't alter the greatness of the word of God. It is still is the word of God that's powerful to save. 
and you and I. Perhaps sometimes we have lost something of the wonder of the fact that when we pick up God's word, when we listen to God's word, that what we are receiving and hearing is a great word because it is from God himself. The scriptures remind us time and time again of the greatness of the word of God. Right from the first chapter in Genesis, where we're reminded that God spake and this world came into being. Reminds us of the power and the wonder that's found in the word of God. How does the psalmist put it? In Psalm 33, he says this, talking about God. Verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. We see the power and the wonder of God's word in creation. And down through the scriptures, we see the power and the greatness of the word of God. We think of him pouring out the floodwaters in Noah's time. We think of him feeding the children of Israel in the wilderness. Again, Psalm uh, picks up on this, and in Psalm 78 and verses 23 and 24, we read this. Yet he that God commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down on them manna to eat, and gave them the grain of heaven. You see, the scriptures are full and remind us time and time again of the power, the greatness of the word of God. And don't we see it writ large in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? We think of him as the one who is able with one word to still the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee. We think of how in one word he is able to heal those who are sick. And we think of even the greatness of his word as he cried out to Lazarus, come forth from the grave. We see his power over death. You see, when God speaks, his word is great. And Paul writing to the church at Rome, reminds the church in Rome and reminds us of that great truth right in the beginning of his letter in Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The reason why I like the ESV translation is because I think it centers upon the greatness of our God, not on the foolishness of man or otherwise. But as we look at this chapter in uh, Two Kings, I want us to consider some ways in which the greatness of God's word is seen in this chapter and how it can be an encouragement to us. The chapter starts with Naaman, a commander in the army of Syria. He's a great man. He's had a victory over uh, Israel. Although, as a, 
the word of God reminds us is it is the Lord who had given him that victory. And what a sad verse, the, what a sad sentence that is at the end of verse 1. He was a mighty man of valour, but he was a leper. He suffered from leprosy. And then we read how the Syrians in their raids had obviously taken some of the children of Israel as captives. And there was one little girl who was taken from the land of Israel and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Again, somebody, as we were looked at this morning, we're not told her name. But she shows us something of the greatness of God's word because she faithfully witnessed to her mistress. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. She was utterly confident in the power and in the word of God that if Naaman visited this prophet, that through the word of God, through the power of God, Naaman could be healed. You see, the greatness of God's word isn't limited. It's not limited to being used by a prophet. It's not limited to be used by those who preach. But the greatness of the power of God is available to each one of us. As we go about our lives, we can take with us the greatness of the word of God. And we also see it, don't we, in the word of the prophet who tells of restoration. We see that (coughs) Naaman goes to the king and his king and the king sends a message to the king of Israel who immediately thinks that it's some, it, it, it's some pretext for Syria to, uh, to attack and he rips his clothes. But Elisha hears of this and he tells the king of Israel, send Naaman to me. And Elisha, when he comes to Elisha's house, he sent a message, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Again, there's utter confidence in the word of God and in the power of God. Here the word of, of, the, of, the, of, of Elisha the prophet tells of restoration, tells of healing, tells that there is an answer to Naaman's illness, to Naaman's problem. And again, that reminds us, isn't it, that by the word of God that we have, we have the answer to the problems of men, women, and children in the world in which we live. It's only God's word that will ultimately deal with the issues that people face. You know, we live in a society that seems to be there seem to be so many different problems that people have, that people, uh, that, that, that individuals feel they face. We read of depression. We read of stress. We read of so many different things that's affecting society. We read of people not being able to cope with work. We feel of people not being able to cope with family situations. And there's only one answer. And that's the great word of God. And we also see the greatness of God's word in the words of the servants who are able to humble a proud man. You know, as I thought about this, when Naaman is told by Elisha to go and wash in the Jordan, Naaman is immediately angry and 
He expected the prophet to come out and to perform some form of ceremony over him. And then he looked and said, well, you know, why should I wash in Jordan? Why shouldn't I go and wash in the rivers of Damascus? Aren't they just as good? And he goes off in a half. And his servants came near to him and said to him, my father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Just consider who those servants are. They're likely to have been Syrians. They knew nothing or very little of the Lord God of Israel. But something had obviously struck them. That as Elisha had given that word to Naaman, something had struck them that there was power, there was authority in that word. And they themselves recognised that what Naaman had received was a great word. And again we're reminded that God is able to use servants, even those who do not recognise perhaps who he is, to say and to speak and to proclaim the greatness of of his word. As we look at this then, what lessons can we learn? I think the first lesson that we must learn is that we must never underestimate the opportunities that the Lord gives us. Think of Andrew, the disciple in John 1, where he meets with Jesus and his first thing that he does is he goes and tells Simon Peter. We don't read very much of Andrew in the New Testament. He was an apostle, but he doesn't seem to be, if we can put it this way, a major apostle but he tells and calls his brother, Simon Peter. And we think of that great sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. We think of the, of the, of the opportunities that Peter and John had to proclaim the gospel in the early church. We think of the letters that Peter wrote. And he was there because his brother had called him. You know, we must never underestimate the opportunities that God gives to us. And I'm sure we can think of lots of situations where God has used an individual, we may not even know their name, but they've used that individual to reach out and to witness to somebody who's gone on and proclaimed mightily the word of God. We think of that man in the, I think it was the Methodist church in Suffolk on that snowy winter's morning who went into the pulpit because the preacher couldn't make it and who was sitting in the congregation but a young Charles Haddon Spurgeon and all he said to him was look unto the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing individual. He faithfully proclaimed the, God, uh, the word of God. And as a result, by God's grace, we had the man, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and all the greatness that he has done. We must never, ever underestimate the opportunities that God gives us to share his word. You know, we can think of the opportunities that we get as parents and as grandparents to share the word of God with our children and our grandchildren. Think of Timothy. Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy 1, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois.'" 
and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. What an encouragement that should be to us. Even if perhaps our children or grandchildren show no sign at the moment of following Jesus. God's great word can come back to them and does come back to them and is able to say. There's an elder, the church where I grew up in, um, in Surrey, godly man, and his son had wanted nothing to do with the gospel. We never saw him in church. He went on, oh, he was married, had family. But after Mr. Quaintance's death, his son came to know and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his testimony was that he was reminded time and time again of the lessons that he'd learned from his godly mum and dad. We must never underestimate the power of teaching our grandchildren and children the living, great word of God. We must never underestimate the effect of a Sunday school teacher or a teacher of children and young people can have on the lives of those children. We must never forget that God is able to bring back to their remembrance those things that they have heard. No, this chapter in Two Kings encourages me because it reminds me that the greatness of God's word is because of who God is. And surely we must rely on and we must plead the promise that we find through Scripture, but particularly the promise <clears throat> in Isaiah 55 where the Lord says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, and making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We see the greatness of God's word. But this chapter also reminds us of the ability of God's great word to deal with a man's greatest need. Here is Nahum. He's heard from this young servant girl. But he doesn't seem to listen initially to what she says. You see, the young servant girl had said quite clearly that it was the prophet in Israel who was the answer to his problem. And Naaman, in his ignorance, perhaps in his pride, does not go straight to the prophet, does not seek out the prophet, but he seeks out the king of Israel. And he almost gives the king of Israel a heart attack because the king of Israel does not have a clue. Can I, am I God? Can I heal? But God, in his mercy, sends him on to Elisha, the prophet. And as Elisha, through his servant, brings the message, the answer to his need, we see his pride. We see his pride in that he expected Elisha to come out and to perform some, some great act over him. <clears throat> 
so that all may, as it were, wonder. You see, pride is the greatest problem that needs to be dealt with in you and I. It was pride that caused the fall of Satan, who wanted to be equal with God. It was pride that caused the fall of man. Adam didn't like the idea that God could put restrictions upon what he could do. Adam wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. God had said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree. And Adam said, no, I'm going to do that. And don't we see the pride of man writ large as we read through the scriptures? And how often the pride of man is brought to our attention. In Proverbs, we could look so many scriptures, but in Proverbs 8, verses 12 to 13, we read this, I, wisdom, and perhaps wisdom points to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. You see, pride is one of the, our biggest issues. And I'm sure, like me, even as a Christian, we struggle with our pride. We're reminded time and time again that we can be proud, we can be arrogant. Naaman had enormous pride, so much so that he was prepared to ignore the word of God through the servant uh, through, through through Elisha, and he was prepared to storm off in a huff. How Naaman must have thanked his servants, who came and reminded him the greatness of the word that he had heard. And then we see that God is able to deal with his ultimate problem, his disease, his leprosy, his uncleanness. And we notice how Elisha sends him to the Jordan. Elisha does not want to be anywhere near Naaman when he's healed because he wants God and God alone to have all the glory. And we see from 1 Kings 5 that Naaman is a changed man. He comes back to Elisha. And in verse 13 we read, oh, sorry, in verse 17, he comes back. And verse 16, he says, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive, oh, sorry, and he comes back, and he says this in verse 15. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. And so accept now a present from your servant. Naaman was a changed man. Verse 18, we read of that his desire is to worship God. And he's aware that there is a sense of right and wrong. And he reminds Elisha that there will be times when he will need to go with his master into the house of Rimmon to worship there because the master leads, leans on my arm. Perhaps if we're harsh, we can criticise Naaman for that. But he does realise that there is only one way to worship, and that is to worship, one God to worship, and that is to worship the living God. What a picture of God's saving grace we have here in changing this man, Naaman. 
And you know, we need to be reminded of this, that it is only the great word of God that is able to change a person, that's able to deal with their pride and with their sin. It was only the great word of God that was able to deal with us. It was only the power of the word of God as applied by God the Holy Spirit that brought us, as it were, to our senses. How often, like Naaman, perhaps we turned away and we were not prepared to bow our knee. We felt we could save ourselves. But God, in his mercy, brought us to himself. And as we take the gospel into the world, surely this chapter reminds us of the importance of us proclaiming the word of God. Doesn't Romans 10 remind us that people are not going to hear unless God's word is preached? And God's word is not going to be preached unless he sends preachers. And that should remind us that we need to pray for the preaching of the gospel. We need to remember those who proclaim it. We need to pray to the Lord our God to raise up young men and women to serve him in our day and generation. There is no greater need that the church needs, there's no greater need that this country has, but that we have those who will faithfully proclaim God's word. But it's not only for those, perhaps, who God calls especially to preach, but each one of us is called to share his word with friends, with neighbours, with family and how we need to pray for one another, that as God gives us opportunities, that we would take them boldly and that we would realize the greatness of the word that we share and the effect that it can have, that it's the word of God that changes lives. But as we draw to a close, surely we have to see in this, past, this, this, in this chapter here a signpost pointing us to the one who is the greatest word, the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God, the living word that he, as Naaman, washed in the River Jordan. It's only his precious blood that's able to cleanse us from our sin. Oh, that we could grasp more and more of the wonder of those verses that we read in the first gospel, uh, in, in, in John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then later on in that chapter, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ.
No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word. We've already thought of some of the power of his great words that he preached. But surely there's no greater word than that cry from the cross. It is finished. Are there any greater words than these? The punishment, price of sin has been met. No wonder the curtain of the temple rent in twain from top to bottom. It couldn't do anything else because through him we have access to God our Father, our Heavenly Father. Oh, the wonder, oh, the power, the greatness of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we turn to Revelation, first chapter there, where John, as he sees that vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus says to him, I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's our God. That's the greatness of the word that we have. May we be gripped by it, by a way that we've never been gripped before. May we realise the greatness of the word of God that we have in the scriptures, and primarily through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. May God encourage us as we seek to take the gospel into this needy world, that we have the dynamite of God, the power of God to salvation. That here is the answer to the problems of the world in which we live. And it's found in the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word of God, for his glory. Amen. Amen.